Gar. And I'm Dr. Cameron Garber. And today we're going to talk about how to get faster and lose weight by running slow. It's a little bit controversial. Right. Well, it seems crazy, right? It does. And whenever we talk about it, people are like, I get it mentally, but like, I just can't do it. Right. <laughs> and so we'll talk a little bit more about why and how. Right. So this is a principle that we talk a lot about with our patients, with people that come in asking how they can lose weight. Because we get people that are like, well, I'm running full on, like I'm, I'm working really hard. We've talked about this the past couple of episodes, like working too hard. Today we're going to talk about what it really means. We talk about working smarter, right? We're right. going to talk about what that actually means in practice for your running. Right. So that whole concept of work smarter, not harder is a little cliche and and – I, I like it. I like that phrase yeah. a lot, but it's been maybe misused. Yeah. Uh, misappropriated. Overused. <laughs> yeah, overused for sure. And and so it's finding out how do we work smarter. And it's not necessarily not working hard. It's just being able to put your effort in the right places. Right. Right, definitely. And that's what we've talked about a lot. And we're going to harp on that every single episode. We want you to be doing things that actually make sense for your fitness, for your life, for your health. So let's talk about this today. We're going to get into 80-20 running which is something that's pretty fun. Right. And we're going to talk about how you can start working out a little bit differently to start getting the results you actually want. So we're talking about losing weight and getting faster by running slower. Right. Why would we ever want to run slow, Cameron? Okay. Well, so I guess let's start with the concept of like what, how do we define fast and slow? Yeah. So fast is, is kind of above that, that range where we've it's beyond just breathing harder we've kind of gone uh in, into a zone so i guess there's different zones there's kind of a low zone um or a, a mild zone where we're we're keeping things below the ventilatory threshold and lower um where we're just kind of barely moving not not really having to breathe terribly much harder um and then there's kind of a moderate zone where we're breathing more heavily we're above kind of a ventilatory threshold where we have to start breathing harder, but we're not really going to an all-out maximal effort. That's where most people spend the majority of their training. Yeah. It's kind of in this moderate zone where they just go out and they run at their comfortable pace. And then there's that high zone, which is above your comfortable pace. And so a lot of people, especially when they're trying to push it more, they spend a lot of their time in that high, high zone. And so that's heart rate fairly high, you know, 80% or above often of your of your maximal heart rate. Um, and so people tend to spend the bulk of their time in kind of a moderate zone and then peak up from, from that moderate zone. And we'll talk about maybe the advantages of each zone. So, so oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so let's get into that. You talked about that ventilatory threshold a little bit. Mm -hmm. For those of us who don't know what that means who aren't like in this world every day, right. what does that mean in practice? So in practice, a lot, of, a lot of the time we'll define the ventilatory threshold in a way that for people to understand it, it's if you're running along side by side with somebody and you're holding a conversation, it's where you can still kind of hold that conversation without having to stop to breathe. So when you're, when you're just holding that conversation, you're breathing heavier than you would be at rest or walking really slowly but you're still able to hold the conversation, that's below the ventilatory threshold. When you're able to still talk, but you have to like stop to take a couple of breaths, you're kind of right around that. And then when you have to like, you can say a sentence at a time, but you say that sentence and then you're, and then you, you know, you're breathing pretty heavily and then you say your next sentence, that's above that ventilatory threshold, yeah. right? And so those are very crude terms, but kind of how you can identify that without directly measuring it. Right. Um, those, those are typically within the ballpark of where the, that ventilatory threshold would hit. Right. And so we want that training in terms of your fast training to be above that. So what, I guess that begs the question of what are the advantages of working yeah. out in each one, right? So low intensity training, slow, steady training is going to make a bigger improvement on your physiological adaptations to, to running. So it, it releases what's called interleukin-6, which is a stimulant of making a lot of physiological changes in the body that force us to become more efficient at utilizing calories uh, for a longer period of time. 
it stimulates a lot of changes within our body. And so, um, yeah, we could dive deeper into that, but just to make it simple, like longer periods of time spent in that low intensity zone are, are what really stimulate your body to make a lot of adaptations and change for building up your aerobic base. So being able to burn fat for a longer period of time and, and being able to stay at that kind of steady state exercise for a longer period of time. So again, practically we're talking about endurance here, right? Those right. changes that end up affecting your ability to just run forever right. at that pace where it's just like, I could keep this up forever. Right. And so to make those physiological adapt changes for endurance, um, slow running is better. Right. On the weight loss side of things, we tend to burn more fat when we're in that we t tend to burn a higher percentage of fat when we're in that um, zone. Yeah. So we're burning lower total number of calories, but a higher percentage of fat. Okay. So people ask all the time, well, shouldn't I like work out really hard? And we talked about this a little bit last time. Shouldn't I work out hard so that I'm burning more fat? And that's not really the case. When right. we get into it, slow is what's going to ultimately burn more fat per time spent. Right. And, and so it's finding out that level that happens to correspond pretty well with that ventilatory threshold of where I can burn enough total calories that it makes a difference, but not uh, be so efficient that I'm really not burning any, any calories at all. So I'm burning, you know, maybe 70% fat or more, but it's only 100 or 200 calories. So it's not a lot of total calories. Right. Whereas if I work out a little bit harder so that I'm burning more like 50% of 500 or 600 calories per hour, right? Then I'm burning significantly more total calories and fat. And so it's finding for the individual where that sweet spot is of yeah. where they're gonna burn the highest percentage of fat as a part of their total calories. Okay, so. so we've talked about running slow. Let's talk about now the benefits of running fast. Why then would we ever wanna run fast? If we're trying to lose weight, would we ever want to run fast? Absolutely, and that's, so that's, that's the key is it's, I love hard workouts. So I think sometimes I get misinterpreted about running slower. Um, it, you know, I, I'm always encouraging people to run slower and move, you know, to, to more of this slow, steady exercise style, the, which is true for 80% of the workout. And we'll yeah. dive into that more. Okay. But 20% of the workout, I want you going pretty much all out. And, and so the, the reason why you'd want to go hard is that's where you make um, bigger changes in your overall fitness level. That's essentially where you're telling your body, I need you to get better, yeah. faster, stronger. Um, and that's where we make more um, a, of a different type of adaptation, right? That's where we really make those improvements in lung function and heart function, um, where we get stronger. And so it's there is where we grow and, and push ourselves um, in terms of exercise capacity, whereas slow increases our endurance capacity, right? And so there's, there's different types of, of well, for lack of a better term, suffering. <laughs> when, when talking about the runner, yeah. especially, you know, when you're, when you're training for endurance running, there's different types of suffering. There's that type of suffering that you're pushing yourself all out maximally pushing yourself past that right. ventilatory threshold, past your anaerobic Full threshold. Full-out sprints, basically. Right, where you're just crushing it, yeah. where you're killing yourself. Um, that That is really, really helpful at pushing those physiological parameters and, and helping you to improve. Yeah, to get faster. To get faster, yeah. to improve your times, to get more fit, and and things like that. The, the problem is, is if we do too much of that, we, we don't keep up with that physiologically. We yeah. can't recover quickly enough. And so they've shown that people that start doing more workouts like that um, wind up having diminishing returns. Okay. And so it's finding out the right amount. And so I love a hard workout. It's just the right amount of hard workout. Yeah, so we tease this 80-20 principle. Let's dive into this a little bit because we've mm -hmm. talked about the benefits of slow running. We've talked about a little bit of the benefits of fast running. Let's find that balance now. And I really like having a hard set rule to be able to determine how I should be setting my workouts. Let's talk right. about 80-20. What does that mean? So 80-20 um, is a ratio, 80% in that slow zone and 20% in that fast zone. And so 
one of the, the biggest keys to that is the polarization of the two zones. I guess a big point that we want to make is that fast running cannot replace slow running. So you can't get the same benefits from exercise by just running faster. So some people think, or it's, it's commonly thought, um, and especially because of some fitness trends lately, um, that by pushing harder, I can spend less time and get the same benefits. Yeah. Right? And that's true to some degree in terms of calorie burn, but it's not going to be the same type of right. calories. And we talked about this last episode, too, right. episode two about HIIT training right. and why or why not to do that. So if you haven't looked at that episode yet, go back to episode two where we cover HIIT training right. and working out at those really high intensities versus the lower intensities. Right. So some, some of the same principles apply. So, yeah, fast running can't replace the benefits of slow running. But conversely, slow running can't replace the benefits of fast running. So if we so did we just... both. Right, exactly. So if we did just slow running, we'd never really get faster. We'd yeah. be able to go further, right. but we wouldn't necessarily be able to go faster. faster. Okay. And so, um, same conversely, just by running harder and harder and harder, we could get faster, Yeah. but we're not necessarily going to get faster over a long period of time. Okay. So our sprint times would get better, but our <laughs> distance times would diminish. Right. And same thing for weight loss. We're going to lose weight pretty effectively, potentially at first, if we can avoid injury. Um, at running high speed. High intensity. Yeah, high intensity. Right. But a lot of the time, it kind of backfires over time, yeah. and, and people wind up with, with more injuries, with more problems. They, they tend to um, actually lose weight more slowly. They tend to plateau harder. Yeah. Well, and then we um, talked about, too, needing to eat back all those calories so it's really right. easy to bounce back. Right. It, it's harder to keep that up as a pattern yeah. um, for, for the weight loss side of things. And so um, really, uh, we, should, we should train more like a runner trains for weight loss as well, um, but maybe not focus on uh, the time and, and distance as much, and, and it's less more about just feeling good. Yeah. Right? And I really like that too, as we've talked about this and as I've gotten into this myself, the idea that I don't necessarily have to be like watching my watch and my heart rate constantly, mm -hmm. which I mean, if you want to stay in your heart rate zones and stuff, you need to be on top of that, but you can start to feel how you should be running. Mm -hmm. And really, I mean, you can Absolutely. go out and do this with no equipment whatsoever. We talked about, you know, the ventilatory right. threshold, feel how it is that, that you're running. Are you working hard or are you at that like slow, right. steady state? And you can pretty well dial that in after a few attempts of just hitting right. it, seeing where your heart rate's really at right. at a certain pace, and then you can just cruise. Right, right. And so you do, you develop that ability to feel it. So one of the, the big risks there without monitoring it though <laughs> is most people like to hang out, and studies have shown this over and over again, most people like to hang out just above that ventilatory yeah. threshold. And so... As we said, fast running can't replace slow running. Slow running can't replace fast running. But moderate intensity running is essentially just garbage time. <laughs> so it, not really. It, there are some heart-lung benefits sure. and some other things. But for weight loss, we're not really burning much, if any, fat. Yeah. And for racing, we're not improving. Yeah. And we're not building our endurance. So I'm not I'm not improving my 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 overall fitness level. I'm not increasing my VO2 max or, or my ability to move air through my body necessarily. I'm not really improving that. I'm maintaining that fine, but I'm not improving that yeah. without, without going out all maximally. Um, but then I'm also not building my endurance either. Right. And so it's still enough stress on the body that it causes some negative effects of, of high intensity training. Yeah. But it's not low enough to get the the benefits that interleukin six and some mm -hmm. of those other things. It's not low enough intensity to get those benefits of endurance training. Okay. And so it winds up just being counterproductive miles. Right. And so the risk to doing it just by feel, especially to start out, um, is that you may be doing more junk miles. And so I do think it's helpful to have a heart rate monitor, especially at first, but you definitely get into a groove where you can feel yeah. the difference. Yeah. And the more fit you get, the the more, not wiggle room you have in those zones, but the more you can feel the difference, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so you you become more used to it and it, it becomes something very easy to do rather than this like 
arduous, like, ah, I'm going so slow, right. or then I have to push it so hard, right? right. You kind of get into a groove where you really enjoy training that way. Right. So let's talk for a second before we get into the nitty gritty of 80-20 running. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about heart rate zones mm -hmm. really quick. This is, I think, an episode unto itself that we'll get to in the future, but let's just right. throw out some numbers real quick. So we talked about that kind of garbage middle zone. Right. A lot of people work out there. I think a lot of people feel like when they're in the kind of 140s, 150s as far as heart rate, mm -hmm. just like, oh, this is where I can cruise forever. Right. That's technically the garbage zone for a lot of people. Right. You, right. And so that's why we encourage that individualized testing. So a lot of things will say like, oh, 60 to 70 percent of your heart rate max and then 80 to 90 and then 90 plus and or that I've seen so many different types of breakdowns of yeah. that, right, as to what's beneficial. So 40 to 60 is usually considered more of a fat burning zone yeah. and, and things like that. I, the more people I test, the more I find that for the individual, yeah. those kind of blanket zones don't really fit the individual. Correct. And so that's, I do feel like it's a helpful thing to get that testing done. Um, that being said, I do think you can use those to help guide what you're doing. So uh, I actually have a post that explains nice. um, heart rate training, just kind of very basically mm -hmm. Um, on on our blog, yeah, and we'll link to that blog. in the show notes for this episode. Yeah, too. for the Body Smart blog, um, there I've got kind of a, a brief summary about what heart rate training is and kind of what those zones typically are. Yeah. the advantage of training in each zone. Um, so that, that details that out a little bit more, but essentially, by by making sure you're in the right zones, you know, you can you can make sure you're getting the full benefit of training yeah. in each zone. And like we talked about. More and more research that's coming out is kind of suggesting that staying in that moderate zone, which again, it's debated where that is between 60 and 80 percent or 60 and 70 percent of max heart rate. Um, of max heart rate. Mm -hmm. And that unfortunately tends to be where most people hang out is somewhere between 60 and 80 percent. And those are kind of often the zones where we see the least amount of improvement. Yeah. So we tend to see more improvement at red line and more improvement at slow. Right, and to find your age-adjusted max heart rate, that's what it's called, there are a bunch of online calculators, or you can mm -hmm. just pull out your own calculator and go 220 minus your age, and right. that's your age-adjusted max heart rate. And then you can apply that right. 40 or to 60% or whatever. But again, those are averages mm -hmm. that are made for a blanket population that aren't specifically set to you. Right. And you've said before that those are off by a pretty significant amount sometimes. Yeah, oftentimes they really are. I, I find that all the time as we've tested people, yeah. that those are those are significantly off, and so that they become quite variable. 10 to 15 beats per minute is, is a big jump it is, often, it is. oftentimes. So. Okay, uh, so let's get into 80-20. So I'm going to stop oh, yeah. because yeah. let's get into this 80-20 because now I know that I'm supposed to spend a certain amount of time only in slow running and then only in fast or more intense running. Right. How am I supposed to split that up? Right. So the, the key is to really polarize your efforts. If you're going to run slow, run slow. And, and helping to define that is important. If you're going to run fast, go hard. Right. But don't spend much time in the middle because it's, it's, we're not really improving either end of the spectrum. We're not improving endurance, we're not improving fat burn, and we're not improving fitness yeah. if we're hanging out in the middle. So 80-20, 80% 80 um, of the time, you're going in that slower, um, less intense, so low intensity zone where you're just putting in the time. Okay. And so the key with this zone, and I know that's frustrating for people because we want to be able to get my workout in and get it done fast, Yeah. right? I wanna be able to put more work in in 15 minutes <laughs> so that I only have to spend 15 minutes. Right. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. And so it's kind of a bummer, I know. But when we go back to kind of the origin story of our body and how it works, our ancestors did not work out really hard for 45 minutes and then sit at a desk for the rest of the day, right? They were constantly moving. And so that's part of why our system is designed that way, built that way, yeah. is for the slow burn, yeah. is for our, our body to just progressively get more efficient the more we use it. Right. Right. And to specifically burn fat right. at that level. Right. And so that's kind of our body's default storage form of energy too because we can live longer off it. There's more calories per gram mm -hmm. of fat than right. there are of, of um, carbohydrate or protein. And so it's, it's really an efficient storage form of energy. And so that helps us to be um, 
more effective if we understand that and then train accordingly. Okay. So the 20%, that's where we really have to push it. And again, thinking back to our ancestors, that that 20% is, is some of those activities that did make them stronger that they didn't do a ton of, but where they had to, you know, maybe do some harder tasks on the farm often enough that they got stronger and whatever. And you see that same thing with like Idaho potato farmers, right? <laughs> those one of those kids hit junior high and high school and they have to really start working harder. All of a sudden they start getting broader shoulders right. and getting stronger and whatever. But that type of work is actually really, really good for building both endurance as well as strength, right? And so you see quite a bit of really good athletes coming from more agrarian societies because it's a really good um, kind of mix of workload. Yeah. Same idea applies to weight loss and other things like that, that if we apply the right balance, and that 80-20 has been shown to just be that right balance. It's the right amount of doing enough volume of work to make your body make those physiological adaptations in in becoming more um, metabolically efficient for the slow burn, for yeah. the fat burn, right? Right, And then the 20% is the right amount of intensity to improve your overall fitness level and your fitness capacity, right? right? And so it's, it's uh, I kind of see it as the 80% is where we're elongating how long I can train for. Sure. And the twenty percent is bumping up the capacity of how your total speed that right, you can cruise at. Right. The, yeah. How how much harder I can work for that period yeah. of time. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's break it down then if I'm exercising for let's just for numbers sake, ten minutes. Okay, right. we've talked about the eighty twenty principle. Right. So that means that in a ten minute workout, I'm spending eight minutes of that time total in this slower, lower burn, two minutes in the higher burn, right? Precisely. But let's break that down because you don't have to do eight minutes and then two minutes of a sprint. Right. Let's talk about ways to break that down and change up your efforts because that gets right. old. Right. And so that's one thing that we, we talk about often with people is how, how to do the 80-20 right. in, in real life. So, um, yeah, the, there's eight minutes and two minutes. And that's the simplest and often where I right. start people out. And so that's one question I get a lot. Does it matter if it's 80-20 within that same day? Yeah. Or does it matter if it's 80-20 within the week? Good point. Um, I would say it doesn't really matter um, as much. I do think if, if you are going to have a full day that's a 20% day, right, that's that high intensity day, then you've got to have four days, so days before and days after, where you're going at a lower intensity. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So one out of every four five workouts needs to be high intensity and then four low intensity. And again, moderate intensity doesn't seem to be yeah. making much of a difference in, in all the studies that, that have kind of looked at that in recent, you know, since about 2000 right. on, has shown that moderate intensity workouts just don't have much benefit. So if we can, we can spend those times. So another way of breaking that down then is saying, um, Okay, if, if eight out of every 10 minutes needs to be spent in, in that low intensity and then two out of every 10, you can kind of bunch those together then. So if you're working out for 30 minutes, let's say, you can take the two minutes from each of those 10 minute blocks and save that. So if you're gonna go on a 30 minute run, you could do like a fast finish run, which okay. is something I do all the time, yeah. especially because I live around hills. And so I'll go 24 minutes of kind of coming downhill, working around a gradual uphill, and then when I hit that last six minutes, and boom, I'll off. push it hard, yeah, and do kind of a fast finish up the hill where I'm really going all out, yeah, so that I'm not in that moderate zone, the zone. <laughs> right? I'm really pushing it and killing it. And so that, if you were to go 24 minutes and then a six minute burst at the end and then a cool down, that'd be just fine. perfect, yeah. So that's still holding to that 80 20 principle. Yeah. So same applies. So you just do the math the same. Essentially, if you're going 50 minutes. You'd multiply that by two, so sure. you're doing 10 minutes of low intensity uh, to balance that out. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And we've talked a lot about this in terms of like weight loss and fat burn and stuff, but this applies completely to someone who's just exercising to get better. For, for example, if you're training for a 5K or a 10K or maybe even a marathon, mm -hmm. this same principle still applies. Let's talk about why 
why is it important that fat burn be a part of your training program, even if it's just for running, not for weight loss sake? Right. So you hear a lot of runners talk about hitting the wall. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I, I, I felt it. Right, right. And so some of that is just based on the amount of time that you're training, yeah. right? That if you're a marathon is a great example of that. It's just such a long <laughs> race that, like, physiologically, our body doesn't normally work at, a, at that intensity for that long. Four hours straight. Right, yeah. So we hit that wall usually between mile 18 and 22 mm -hmm. for, for a lot of people. Um, sometimes people hit multiple walls. Um, <laughs> The way to push where that wall comes in yeah. is by training your body to burn fat for longer before we become depleted. So we're always burning a mixture of both fat and carbohydrate. But if we can stay in a higher percentage of fat burn for a longer period of time, we can avoid that fatigue. And so there's some runners that can get to where they're not taking, you know, I'll have people that say, you know, I take some kind of Jolly Rancher or, shots or, or whatever yeah. shot or, yeah, shot blocks or whatever. I'm taking those every – I've heard as frequent as like two miles. Which, oh, man. I, I mean, that's a ton of calories <laughs> that you're eating as you're running. Um, Nasty too. Right. <laughs> I've had, you know, most between like eight and ten miles yeah. or something, things like that. Everybody's kind of got their own strategy. But they're taking some kind of supplemental energy. But I have runners that have been running this way for a while that through a whole marathon may take one kind of energy, some kind of energy shot or, or sugar. I have some, though, that run like their 20-mile runs will just take a Jolly Rancher, and that's it. And that's it. Wow. Right. And so it, it, if you can train your body to go longer before you really have, have exhausted those reserves and mm -hmm. started tapping into more of muscle breakdown and, yeah. and using that – um, as, as energy or so there's a couple other like biochemical processes yeah. that you can use to, to create energy off of lactic acid and other things like yeah. that. Um, if you can avoid having to do that for a longer period of time, you can go longer at a higher intensity, yeah. thus run faster. And so where you build up the ability to do those types of things is by training in that 80% that zone. slow. Uh, right, that 80% slow zone is where you develop those physiological adaptations. And so that's why even the middle distance runner, well, middle distance for endurance running, um, why those types of people would want to train slower, even though a 5K may feel like more of a sprint in yeah. some races, um, for some people, and for other people, it feels like a marathon. Um, <laughs> But either way, the more you can train your body to be physiologically active for the bulk of your training and then the other part really pushing it, you're going to have a better result because you're going to train both types of systems. Um, you're definitely not going to be as fast training at 80-20 at your peak, so you won't be a better sprinter that way. Okay. Um, your overall speed might come down in terms of sprint speed. Yeah. But your ability to maintain a higher speed. So your race time, essentially. Right, right is going to improve. And so this isn't necessarily the way you'd want to train to become a sprinter. Sure, a 100-meter dash isn't right, going to be using right. this. And even for some explosive sports like uh, volleyball players, things like mm -hmm. that, isn't necessarily the way you'd want to train. But to build a good aerobic base for a volleyball right. player – that's great. And then to work um, and spend a little bit more time in some of those agility drills and other things like that, yeah. uh, that it's a good kind of off-season way to maintain your overall endurance so that you can last to the fifth set or whatever, right? <laughs> right. In a tennis match. Uh, well, not that most of us will never get to a fifth match of a tennis <laughs> uh, match be, or fifth set of a tennis match because most of us only play three set matches. Um, anyway. Uh, that's really the advantage, though, um, in in training at that slower rate is we build our overall endurance yeah. and ability to push it harder for longer. Right. So we've talked about a couple of principles today. We've talked about starting to train slower because that's what's going to actually build up that aerobic capacity, the ability to endure your exercise, right? right? So start training slower. And we talked about how to do that. Well, heart rate, A, mm -hmm. and B, learning to sort of feel what it's like to be training at that level 
where you can still keep a conversation, where it's not like, oh, I'm working hard, right? right. Because it's really pretty darn slow, guys. It really feels pretty slow <laughs> right. when you get to the, and it's like, oh, I need to be in like the 120s to 130. Like that's, right. yeah, that's for, slow feeling. Yeah, for a lot of people, it is that slow. And, and it's a big mental transition. Yeah, yeah, mentally it's huge. And so be disciplined in that for a while. A, you'll feel that the more you do it, you'll feel that speed actually begin to increase over time you'll actually be able to run at a higher intensity but still be in that zone. So a higher, not heart rate intensity, not zone intensity necessarily, yeah. but you'll be able to go at a faster pace. And so it will feel less slow if you stick to it early on. If you don't stick to it early on and you stay in that kind of moderate zone, those junk miles, you won't improve that, that range. Right. So that's running slow. Then we talked about running fast, that you need to have that as part of your running portfolio, but it should only compromise about 20% of your overall weekly or daily run. Okay, so 80-20 running like we talked mm -hmm. about. And then finally, this is something that applies to you whether you're trying to lose weight or trying to become a better overall athlete in terms of your endurance, your race capability. Right. right. So we hope this has been really helpful for you guys. If you have questions specifically about pace, about your own heart rate, uh, again, we do metabolic testing here to figure out where exactly you need to be running at or biking at, or swimming at, based on your specific body. Reach out to us, we'd be happy to answer questions about that. Absolutely. Uh, again, you can get our uh, our full uh, show notes at bodysmartutah.com slash podcast. You can check episode three for some of the things that we've talked about here. Uh, we mentioned that heart rate training blog post, you can catch that there as well. All right. So thank you so much for tuning in to the Body Smart Podcast. We're gonna catch you on the next episode. Sweet. Thanks so much. Yep. We'll see you. Thanks for listening to the Body Smart Podcast. Join us in the Body Smart community on Facebook to share your successes or ask a question for our next episode. Now get out there and take the next step toward living your active lifestyle.